Now let's take a look at a lateral view. Okay, so you can see that a bunch of areas are color coded here. For now, just kind of ignore those. And let's just finish going through these different lobes. One thing I want to mention to you is I want you guys to know this sulcus that you see here. Okay, so you can see it's labeled as the central sulcus, and it would go down like that, okay? So that is the central sulcus. It separates the frontal from the parietal lobes. Okay, it separates the frontal from the parietal lobes. There is another sulcus here I would like you to know, coming down, that separates the parietal from the occipital. And this one is called the parieto-occipital sulcus. So this name actually tells you exactly what lobes it separates, parieto-occipital. Again, this one is called central. Okay, and then one more sulcus I want you to know, and that is this one here. Now they're pulling the temporal lobe back, so it looks a little, you know, funky here, but this sulcus comes all around the temporal lobe. It would be like this, okay? And that is called the lateral sulcus. Okay, lateral sulcus. Okay, so the lateral sulcus would really look more like this. Okay, that is it right there. But again, what they're doing here is they're pulling the temporal lobe back so that you can see inside that sulcus. Okay, so notice when you look, when you kind of pull the temporal lobe back, look inside the lateral sulcus here, Notice there's another area of the brain that is labeled as the insula, okay? So this is considered to be a fifth lobe of the brain. You can see it has its own gyri and sulci. It has its own cortex, the outer, you know, gray matter. And again, it's considered to be a fifth lobe of the brain. You normally do not see it if you're just looking at the lateral view, but you could see it if you look at like a frontal section or maybe a transverse section, you would see that, okay? So I'll point it out again later. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, for the lateral sulcus, it's like where the brain separates from the leg? Yes. The lateral is, yeah, I think you can see it better on the model because here they're kind of pulling the temporal lobe back so it makes it look a little different. It's right there. And in this diagram, if this looks weird, it's because they are not showing the brainstem or the cerebellum. This is just the cerebrum. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about now are these areas that are color-coded. These are called the functional areas of the cortex. So let's just kind of review what the cortex is. Does the insula do anything? Pardon me? Does the insula do anything? Yes, it does. Oh. Yeah, we'll talk about it in just a little while. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a list of the different lobes. This tells you kind of the different functions that are located there. And this is again, just kind of an overview of each of these lobes. You guys can read through these yourself. Okay, just a little bit of an overview. But let's go to these functional areas. Okay, so these are called functional areas of the cortex because they're named after their function. They are named after their function. And what I wanna show you is when we say cortex, remember what we're talking about is just the outer few millimeters of tissue shown here. This is the cortex. So we said this is where most of the neuron cell bodies in the entire nervous system are located, right? So we're just talking about the outer few millimeters of tissue when we look at these functional areas. Okay, so as you can imagine, if you think about all the different things that we have to think about, all the different sensory information that we have to process, the different kinds of movements that we have to control. So we have a bunch of these different functional areas. Of course, they are not all understood yet. We're always trying to research, you know, and figure out more about different parts of the brain. But we do know the functions of some of these. So let's talk about some of them. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna talk about a couple areas, actually three areas in the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe has a lot of functions, but one of the things that happens in the frontal lobe is control of skeletal muscle, okay? So voluntary movement. 
So let's talk first about this area right here shown in blue. Now we've said this is the central sulcus. This gyrus right here is called the precentral gyrus because it's just anterior to the central sulcus. Okay, precentral gyrus. Okay. But the name of the functional area there is primary motor area. Okay, so when you think of these primary areas, you want to think of these as having kind of more of a direct connection with the body. Okay, more of a direct connection with the body. So this is the area that sends action potentials that are going to go out to the muscles we use when we're moving. Okay, voluntary movement. So neurons here, right, and the cell bodies are located here control voluntary movement. So these actually send action potentials that are going to go out to the skeletal muscles that we use when we are moving around. So how would that work? Well, the cell bodies of these neurons are located here. Remember, this is gray matter, so that means it's cell bodies. The axons of these neurons travel down through the spinal cord and they'll synapse in the spinal cord on neurons that go out to the muscles, okay? So these neurons here are called our upper motor neurons. They synapse in the spinal cord on the lower motor neurons that go to the muscles. So again, these are very long neurons. They have long axons that go all the way down into the spinal cord. Now, does this area kind of plan all of our movements? No, it just sends the signals that will go to the muscles that we're using. So the area that's more responsible for planning movements is right here, kind of right in here, shown in red. It is called the premotor area. And by the way, when we use the term area, it's understood we're talking about the cortex, okay, areas of the cortex. Okay, this is also called the motor association area. You can think of these association areas as storing memories, okay? Association areas store memories. So this area actually stores memories of all of these different movements that you have learned, whether it's tying your shoe, brushing your teeth, dancing, um, playing a sport, whatever it happens to be, like a complex series of movements that you have to kind of put together, this is the area that has learned that movement and will then send signals to the primary motor which in turn sends the signals to the muscles that we use to carry out the movement. So this area stores memories. Of learned movements. Usually more complex movements. lobe I want to talk about and that is right here again because this is kind of being pulled away so you can see the insula this looks a little weird this area right here shown in purple is another motor area this is called the motor speech area also called Broca's area okay motor speech or Broca's area so this name motor speech actually tells you what this area does. It controls the muscles we use when we talk. Okay, MM is muscles. So people who have damage to this area, which can happen during strokes or during other kinds of you know, injuries to the brain, they have a condition called Broca's aphasia. And in people who have that, they know what they want to say because they understand speech, but they can't 
speak because they can't, you know, make the muscles work. So like the mechanics of speech are affected, but they understand speak and they know what they would like to say. This is located only in the left hemisphere and like a, the majority of the population, I think it's 97% of the population, it's only on the left side. Okay, that's why if you've ever heard speech is on the left, that's what that means. Mm -hmm. So our, the, the primary motor area is left hemisphere prefrontal gyrus? It is, it's the functional area located in the precentral gyrus, okay? So again, Broca's area or motor speech is only on the left, left hemisphere only. And again, I think that's like 97% of the population. The remaining 3%, it is on the right. Question? I thought you had your hand up. Yes, exactly. It's like when you hear that we have muscle memory because we've learned a movement. Yeah, I think that it's partly that the brain has learned the movement and it's partly that, you know, you're um, kind of have developed, you know, depending on how much you might play, say a certain sport or, you know, do a certain movement, repetitive movement, your body does kind of adapt to it where you develop certain muscles and you're used to performing that movement. So you develop the skill. And then also, even the neuromuscular junction becomes kind of what they say, um, they call it facilitation, where the neuromuscular junction becomes more efficient at releasing the neurotransmitter and the binding of the neurotransmitter and then sending of the action potentials, all of that becomes a little bit, kind of works a little bit better. So I think it's all of those things. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there is a difference. I think it's just a difference in um, the function of that particular part of the brain between the right and the left. Now, if this is on the right side, um, I'm not sure what that same area would then do, you know, on the left side of that person. That's a good question. I don't know. Okay, so now let's go back into the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe you can think of as being more for sensory information, receiving and processing sensory information from most of the body. So this gyrus here that's posterior to the central sulcus, this is called the post-central gyrus. Okay, post-central gyrus. And the functional area there is can see is labeled for you here. It is called the primary, and you can say somatosensory or just sensory area. So again, primary areas kind of are more directly connected with the body. So this is the area that first receives the incoming sensory information from the body. And this won't include special senses, like doesn't include vision or smell or hearing or any of that, but it includes all the other types of sensations from the rest of the body. So this would be like touch, pressure, pain, temperature, kinds of sensations. Uh, like when you, you know, close your eyes and you feel an object and you know what that object is, it's because, you know, that area is receiving those, you know, different signals from those sensory receptors. So that type of information is actually called proprioception, knowing the position of the body parts and kind of knowing how the body is moving is a specific type of sensory information. Um, so all of that information travels to this area and then it's going to go from here into the sensory association area, which is just behind the primary area. So this is called you can say somatosensory or just sensory association area. Again, association areas store memories of past experiences. So this is the area that would store memories of, you know, different kinds of sensations so that we recognize them. You know, the feeling of clothing against your skin or again, if you close your eyes and, you know, feel an object, you know what that object is because you have a memory of that stored 
in this area. Okay, so stories and memories of sensory stimuli. So that you recognize it. Okay, let's go back into the occipital lobe. You can think of the occipital lobe as being for visual input, visual images, recognizing visual images. In the most posterior part of the occipital lobe, this area back here, this is called the primary visual area. Okay, primary. So this is the area that receives visual images coming from our optic nerves. Okay, so it receives all of the visual images. Kind of interesting because the eyeballs are way out here and so that information has to go all the way back to the most posterior part of the brain. From here, those visual images will now go into this area just in front of the primary visual. This is called the visual association area, okay? Visual association area. So again, the primary area is the area that first receives the visual images. sends them on to the visual association area. And this area is it's very interesting because like the rest of the cortex, it's really highly organized so that different types of images are stored in different areas. Okay, so we have an area that's like, for instance, just for faces. We have an area just for places we've been or objects. Okay, so this recognizes the visual images as we store memories here. It's an interesting video, and you can probably go to YouTube and look this up, a video of, of a woman who had damage to her visual association area uh, for faces, and so she was not able to recognize faces ever. So even, you know, like looking at a picture, and then when the picture is taken away, just for a few seconds, she would look at that same picture again, she wouldn't recognize the face. So this could be a picture of herself. It could be a picture of, uh, I was gonna say the president, but I don't know why anyone would wanna recognize that face anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, could be, you know, her husband, I mean, people she knew really well. So she had to use other kind of cues to recognize people like their voice and you know things like that. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's kind of dormant or are you? I believe she had had some kind of um, injury or a uh, stroke, I don't remember what it was, but she had had something that had damaged that area. Okay, and it was very interesting though because everything else was working normally, you know. The visual images were coming in from the, the eye, and, you know, the optic nerve, all of that was working, but it was just this area that wasn't functioning normally. Okay, so the last few areas I want to talk about are going to be kind of in here. Let's take a look at the temporal lobe. This area right here is actually kind of on the lateral sulcus. It borders the lateral sulcus. This is the primary auditory cortex. So this is easy to remember because it's right next to the ear. So this is the area that receives the auditory input, receives sound. Oops. So that's the primary. Okay, auditory area. And from here, it will go into that area that's kind of um, right around the primary, this one here. Okay, so from there, the signals will go into the auditory association area, which stores memories of sounds that we've heard. So again, this would be highly organized so there would be an area for like music that you heard that you know, you know, so you recognize songs. There'd be an area for, you know, voices. 
so you recognize voices of people you know, an area for like your ringtone of your phone or you know different kinds of ringtones that you know. Okay, and then finally, let's talk about these last two. Notice this one right here is actually in the insula. So you were asking about the insula. This is one of the things that has been researched that they know about the insula is that taste is located in the insula. When I first started teaching, actually for several years after I started, and this really wasn't that long ago, I know it sounds like a long time ago to you guys, but it wasn't really that long ago, but they thought taste was right here. This used to be where the gustatory area was. Gustatory refers to taste, but now it is located in the insula, so we'll see if it stays there, but this is where uh, more research has shown the taste is received here in the insula. Okay, so notice that the only thing that's labeled there is the primary. I think it says primary gustatory area. And I think that's because they may not know at this point where the gustatory association cortex is. So just know that this is the primary gustatory cortex and then it's in the insula. And then one more area is right here. Okay, this kind of green area here. Now remember that they're kind of pulling the temporal lobe back. This is labeled as the olfactory cortex. Olfactory is smell. smell. Okay, so this really is on the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. So if you were to look at the brain, it's really like here. Okay, so the medial part of the temporal lobe is like in here. The way that makes it look is it looks like it's kind of more lateral, but it's really in here. Okay, so just know that this is the primary olfactory cortex. Again, they don't label an olfactory association area, so don't worry about that. Just know this is the primary olfactory cortex. So that's where smell first travels to. Okay, so I think that's 11 functional areas. I would like you guys to know. Okay. Now I will ask you to identify these on the model, but I make it really clear as far as what I'm pointing to. Okay, so if you know these, you will not have a problem. Like I point to exactly what area, okay, I'm referring to. I think I make it very clear, but you know, you have to know them. I was wondering where the primary Primary gustatory is this area that's showing uh, right here. Oh, actually you can't see it on the model because it's inside the insula. So that would probably only be on the written exam. Okay. For those, for 10 and 11, is there a way to change the memory of it? Or is it just... I believe there are the association areas for both. Right. Yeah. So because of course we recognize different tastes, we recognize smells and we, you know, so there has to be an association cortex for both of those. Um, so that's where the memories would be stored. I'm just not sure at this point if we understand exactly where they're located. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, is it olfactory or smell and not gustatory? Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Is the insula on the anterior or is there? It's a separate lobe all by itself. It's considered to be a fifth lobe of the brain. So it's a separate area, not part of any other lobe. Okay, guys, so we're just going to talk a little bit more about the cerebrum, and then we will stop there for today. Okay, and we'll finish this on Monday. So again, on Monday, we'll be covering a lot of stuff because I would like to finish the brain and also get started on the spinal cord. Okay, so let's take a look again at this frontal section through the brain. So we know a bunch of stuff on here now, right? You guys know this is the cortex. Okay. Notice that where this cut is made, you can see there's this kind of deep sulcus here. This is the lateral sulcus. Okay, that's the lateral sulcus. Okay, right here. So if this is the lateral sulcus, what would this part of the brain be inside that sulcus? What is that part of the brain inside the lateral sulcus? We were just talking about it. 
is the insula, right? That is the insula. It has its own cortex, so that is what you see inside that lateral sulcus. I would like you to be able to identify that on the diagram. And we also have a model that looks just like this. And actually, the model is a section through a real human brain. Let's put it over here. These are from an actual human brain. Um, this is a mid-sagittal cut, okay, and this one is a frontal section. You'll see when you look at this that one side is more clear. This is the more clear side. This one looks a little bit more cloudy, so I'm going to use this side. And um, I would ask you to identify structures on this just for extra credit, okay? It looks actually just like this picture. And there's a lot of stuff that you can see very clearly on this. So I would only ask you to identify things that are really clear and would be extra credit, okay? So um, what I'd like to show you is, notice you see a bunch of white matter here. Again, right here, this tract is the corpus callosum. Notice we can see the two lateral ventricles here. We can see the third ventricle here. I wanted to also point out um, there is this kind of thin membrane here between the two lateral ventricles. That is on your list. This is called the septum pellucidum. Okay, septum pellucidum. And it's just a thin membrane that separates the two lateral ventricles. This is the longitudinal fissure here. Okay, and now let's talk a little bit about this white matter. So the white matter is a bunch of myelinated axons that are traveling around connecting different areas. As these axons go through this area here, they kind of have to squeeze in between these deep nuclei, okay? The nuclei in here. So they have to travel in between those nuclei. So where these axons are traveling right here between these deep nuclei. This is called the internal capsule. So this is just a special name for the axons in this area. And it actually is labeled for you on this diagram. And then you can kind of imagine as these axons go up toward the cortex, they have to kind of radiate out as they go to different parts of the cortex. So they're gonna come up kind of like this and go out to different parts of the cortex here, okay? Where they radiate out, this is called the corona radiata. And that is not labeled in your book, okay? Corona radiata, it means radiating crown. Okay, so again, it would be like in here. Okay, so I'd like you to know those two parts of the white matter. Okay, one more thing. Let's talk about some of these deep nuclei here. Okay, so you can see here, shown in this kind of blue and this green right here, this actually is down in the diencephalon. But this nucleus here looks like just a little circular thing. And then this one that looks kind of triangular. These function together and they are called the basal nuclei. Okay, basal nuclei. And I would like you to know their names. This one is called the caudate nucleus. And actually, it's really a C-shaped nucleus, if you can see the whole thing. And it has like a little tail. You guys know caudal refers to the tail, so that's where it gets its name. This one that looks like kind of triangular is really two nuclei. The deeper one here, the one that's more medial, is called the globus pallidus. Okay, globus pallidus. And the one that's lateral to that right here is called the putamen. These two together 
the two of these together are sometimes called the lentiform nucleus. But I would like you to know their individual names also. Okay, so what does the basal nuclei do? Mm -hmm. I would have to point to uh, the area here and ask you what, you know, the white matter is called in that specific location. Is that what you were asking? What the, how would, I, how would you know if I'm asking for the corona radiata or? No, the septum hallucinum is just this. It's just that membrane right there between the lateral ventricles. The corona radiata is out here, and it's actually in the tissue of the cerebrum. Okay, so what these nuclei do is they work together to help coordinate movement. So that is their main function. They are involved in motor coordination. This is a group of nuclei that are sometimes um, involved in, um, there's a disease that's a genetic disease called Huntington's disease. And um, people who have Huntington's can't control certain types of movements. They have kind of spastic, jerky movements of their extremities they can't control. They have like facial grimaces. They can't control their facial expressions. This eventually will spread to other parts of the brain the disease spreads to other areas in the brain, and it's eventually fatal. And people who have Huntington's usually does not show up until they're in their 40s, so they don't know they have it unless they have genetic testing. Um, so it's a very sad disease. And um, so it's something that we all would have. We would all have these kind of spastic movements if it weren't for this area kind of working together with the motor cortex to help make our movements look more smooth and coordinated. And this area prevents kind of extra jerky kinds of contractions. Um, also, this <coughs> group of nuclei is involved when we're doing certain movements that don't really require our conscious control. Like when you're walking or running and you're just, you know, you have your kind of that rhythmic swinging of your arms and legs, that's controlled by the basal nuclei. So, we will just say that this group of nuclei is involved in motor coordination, just to kind of make it easy to talk about their function. We actually have several areas in the brain that work together with the motor cortex to help coordinate movement. Okay, so that is the cerebrum. Next time we will talk about the diencephalon and the brainstem, cerebellum, We'll have a lot of stuff to go through and we'll have to start the spinal cord so I'll, I'll be talking fast on Monday and you guys can be hopefully ready for that so you guys can see the brain is a lot of stuff so try to go through as much of this as you can and that will help you a lot for Monday um I think it's the following Monday? What is it? Monday. Monday, the following Monday. So two weeks from this Monday. Yeah. Okay, so you guys models are out. You can help yourself. The slides are out if you did not look at those last time. Let me know if you have questions.